Romans 14 Unplugged. Uh, this is a study entitled uh, Romans 14 Unplugged Feast and Fast and Food. Oh my, bump the screen size up a bit the, uh, uh, the, um, so I can read everything a little bit more easy, a little easier. And let's see, let's jump down to this part. So basically, uh, last week we talked about this idea of, is Paul giving us the option to just choose whichever holy day we want to? Remember, we're in the middle of of discussing, of discussing Romans 14, and within the context, uh, it appears to be that the whole chapter is given over to some disagreements between certain groups in the community, the weak and the strong. We've already talked many, many times, so go back and listen to older um, uh, shows, we've talked numerous times on how he could be referring to weak and strong in terms of Jewish people who keep Torah as the weak, and Gentiles who don't keep Torah as the strong. And that's the favored way to um, break the chapter apart from a traditional Christian perspective. I think, however, that that uh, presents some problems with context, not to mention it, it's slightly insulting to Jewish Torah keepers to describe them as weak simply because they're still keeping Torah even though they believe in Jesus. Uh, Paul himself was a Jewish believer, and he and he kept Torah, and yet he didn't refer to himself as one of the weak. So why, is he making an exception for himself and all those other myriads of, of, of uh, Sabbath-keeping Jews and Torah-keeping Jews in the book of Acts? Are they weak? Or are they strong? So notice there's some, some pushback when we're describing the weak as Torah-keeping Jews, believing Jews who keep the Torah in Paul's day. I have found by my research, and I'm not the only one who came to this conclusion, that probably the better way to describe the weak are Jews in the community that were attending synagogue who had not yet placed their faith in Yeshua. They were um, still investigating the matter. They're open to the idea of Yeshua being the Messiah, but they haven't come to the personal conclusion and made it a public profession yet. So Paul considers their faith is strong in God, their loyalty to Torah is strong, but their faith in Messiah is weak. And that's what he refers to by weak in faith. In, in, in terms of Yeshua is Messiah. They're not hostile. They're not, they have not turned their back on him, and they're not those types of Jews who were going around seeking to kill Paul, taking vows not to eat or drink until Paul was dead. That's not the type of unbelieving Jew that we're talking about in the first century. We're talking about Jews who are still deliberating. They're still wrestling with this idea, and they're dialoguing with believing Jews and believing Gentiles on the identity of Jesus. And yet, in that state, Paul considers their faith weak, meaning undecided. That's what he means by weak. They're stumbling over this idea that Jesus is Messiah, but they haven't yet fallen. So um, we, we, the strong, have a responsibility to bear with them and to bring them into this relationship with Yeshua. At the same time, they're strong in their faith in God, and they're certainly strong in their loyalty to Torah. And so keeping Sabbath isn't a sign of weakness in any sense. It's simply a sign of covenant loyalty. And of course, we already know from history that many Gentiles were also keeping Torah. So this is how we're looking at this passage, at least from my perspective. It's within that context that Paul talks about um, these. Uh, some people in this group are keeping special days. We could see that these are Sabbath days versus Sundays, Sunday. But again, that disrupts the context of the passage. And so the better way to view this from context is that Paul's talking about feast days Verse, I'm sorry, he's talking about um, uh, fast days versus non-fasting days. And that's why the study is called Feast and Fast and Food, oh my. He's talking about days that you eat on versus days that you don't eat on. And this is voluntary. This is something that's not um, laid out in Torah, in black and white. This is simply something that community by community may differ. And that's why we shouldn't be judging one another over it and why God accepts uh, you whether you keep this fast day or uh, whether you don't keep the fast day, whether you uh, do those certain, certain things. So within that context, in that discussion, we're talking about is the Sabbath something that could be put to a vote? Is it something that could be, you know, going one way or the other? And so uh, last week we looked at these bullet points that you see on my screen right now. Reasons why I do not feel that the Sabbath is being spoken of as something that's that, you know, person should be fully convinced in our own mind whether or not it's something you should do. God's commandments were never really viewed that way. When God gave Israel the Torah, there was a covenant responsibility and a covenant, covenant privilege to receiving God's words. And it's always been that way, and it still is that way. The entire Bible is not something that God puts demand for this vote 
um, you know, these are my standards of righteousness. You know, killing is wrong, murdering is wrong, adultery is wrong, lying is wrong. What do you guys think about it? God says, no, that's not the way the Bible works. God says, this is right, this is wrong, and you need to line up with what uh, the standard that I've created. It's not a sliding scale based on man's opinion. Unfortunately, man treats God's word that way. Don't get me wrong, right? The slight, slippery slope that mankind has been on ever since uh, the garden, uh, on his downward slide, uh, you know, towards uh, destruction, uh, is because man has been on this downward spiral, walking away from God's words, and that's our problem, right? That's part of the problem. But so the solution is to return to the standard that is God's word, and to understand that it is God's um, uh, unmovable standard. It's unchangeable. It's not put to a vote. And so Sabbath falls in that same category as a set standard that God uh, established between he and his people. Remember the liturgy we just read? It's a sign between me and the children of Israel. Okay, so um, it's within that discussion that we're picking up uh, our, our um, continuing discussion tonight in my study. We're right here where you can see on my screen, and I'll read and you just listen, okay? In my estimation, uh, if the verses in question were truly about Sabbath versus Sunday, then a number of problematic details begin to arise. And the verses we're talking about, let me just show you real quick, are verses 5 and 6, like we read in the past. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced of his own mind. Is he talking about taking a vote? Is he talking about you keep Sabbath while you keep Sunday, and it doesn't matter which one days you keep? All right. One person observes the day, maybe the Sabbath, like the Jews. The other person, I'm sorry, and he observes it in honor of the Lord. The other one eats and eats in honor of the Lord since he gives thanks to God, while the one abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. Um, notice, by the way, in, in verse 6 that Paul ties in whatever this day is with eating. That's, in my opinion, an unmistakable clue that he's talking about. Um, fasting. He's not talking about Sabbath. Number one, we never fast on the Sabbath. So one person observes a day in honor of the Lord, and the one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord. Notice how he's tying them together. Notice the contrast. The one who observes the day is contrasted with the one who eats, which means the one who observes the day is the one who's not eating, the one who abstains. So um, uh, uh, I, I think this is unmistakable that this is not a Sabbath discussion. But let's go back and let's continue to read uh, what I had. I've got some more bullet points here for us to take a look at. I say, this is my own commentary, to leave the decision in the hands of those who are fully convinced in their own mind appears to be a weak way to establish congregational bylaws for a leader of the likes of Paul. So he's trying to establish these communities throughout his journeys, throughout his missionary journeys, and he's going to go from place to place and tell them, you know, and I'm paraphrasing, you know, um, you guys just need to decide whatever you guys want to do when it comes to Sabbath. It sounds like it would not really... Um, or on worship days. It sounds like it wouldn't really um, uh, um, uh, establish any sort of cohesion. That's just my opinion. Um, I'm not the only one who thinks that way, but uh, I, I don't believe that that's the way that Paul would have structured his congregations. Um, instead, he's going to be more unified. He's going to bring in leadership. He's going to establish leadership. He's going to establish bylaws. And he's going to ground all of it on the written word of God, which was the only Bible that they had at their time. Right? There was no New Testaments in print yet. The letters that he's writing were being circulated. The Gospels were still being uh, kind of put together and formulated. Uh, we wouldn't have canonization of the New Testament for you know a couple hundred years. So the point being, um, or at least something written for him. So the point being is um, the, new, the, 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 um, the existing Tanakh, at least the, the versions of, of Torah scrolls that were available, maybe not the entire Tanakh, but, but at least the portions of the Torah, the five books of Moses, were already established in the faith communities, which would include largely the Jewish communities, but we're now including Gentiles being brought in. So that's what I'm trying to get at. Uh, I continue here in this next bullet point. Jewish and Gentile believers are to rejoice together, right? Read Romans 15.10. My challenge is, how could the newly emerging Messianic communities, which was largely made up of Gentiles, how could they maintain any, any unity and group cohesion, right, Ephesians 4.13, if we had some folks choosing Sabbath and others choosing Sunday, right? This would be a little confusing. In fact, look at it today. Here we are in the 21st century. We've got many churches who worship on Sunday and many churches who worship on Saturday. We've got Seventh-day Adventists along with uh, the Sabbath-keeping Messianic communities. And 
for the most part, I'm not saying we're separated in faith, our Sabbath day keepers versus our Sunday keepers. We're not separated in faith. We do um, have a lot of in common when it comes to believing in Jesus. But watch us try to get together for, for um, say, um, community gatherings. Watch us try to get together for park events. Watch us try to get together for the festivals. It doesn't work, really. We oftentimes have conflicts. And at the very least, we're separated by the days. You know, you got the Jews meeting on one day and then the Christians meeting on a different day. And we're just not even in the same building at the same time. Wouldn't it be neat if we could all get together on the same day in the same building? Or at the very least, um, maybe we could all get together on Saturday and then the next day we could all get together on Sunday. At least let's like share the two. But to have us separated... Um, it just doesn't feel right. It, it just doesn't feel right to me. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. You, you guys write into me. You can comment on my videos and send me emails and tell me where I'm wrong here. But this is just the, the, the feelings, the sentiments that I get. I go on to ask, how could genuine fellowship form in such a setting if Paul's just saying, you know, everybody just pick whatever's right for you? And what if the majority is convinced the Sabbath is correct, right? What if we took it to a, put it to a vote in one community? Let's say we had one church. Let's just not focus on on a lot of groups. Let's just focus on one group. Let's just focus on the say the primary uh, congregation that received Paul's letter. Let's say there's one Roman congregation that Paul had in mind. Like say there's one right in the middle of Rome or something like that, and his letter went there first, and he, they put it to a vote, and the majority says Sabbath is correct. Right? Listen to this part. Should those unconvinced leave and go elsewhere? Right? You know, got a hundred people in the congregation and sixty percent vote. We think we should observe Sabbath. You know, all in favor say not say aye. All of those same sign or something like that. <clears throat> and they raise their hands and they vote Sabbath. You know, sixty percent okay. What do the other forty percent who voted on Sunday do? Where do they go? Do they just concede or do they go? Mm, you know what I say in my commentary, or should they ignore their conscience, stay and yield to the majority vote? Right? Because Paul says each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. So the, the 40% are convinced in their own mind that it's Sunday or another day. And the 60% are fully convinced in their mind that it's Saturday. Is Paul suggesting that they split? Right? Should they, as my... Uh, um, my Torah study buddy is fond of saying, should they balkanize, right? Should they break up into smaller, mutually exclusive groups that don't agree with one another? Is what, what the word balkanize uh, indicates. You know, broken up into smaller, sometimes mutually hostile against one another. Um, I'm not saying that Sabbath, Sabbath keepers and Sunday keepers should be hostile towards one another, but sometimes it turns out that way, right? We're arguing over which days are correct. Um, you know, balkanization. Is that what Paul's suggesting? I don't think that's really what he's getting at. So let's keep reading down through this and we'll work our way down and we'll stop at the conclusion. We'll pick up the conclusion next week. Uh, so here's what I have to say. How one answers this question depends on who the we are in this question and what is meant by a certain day. This uh, 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 paragraph that we're reading right now was actually captured in a little video that I cr that we watched a little earlier. So go back and watch the video from my YouTube channel, Our Christian Street of Worship Got Any Day of the Week. This is part of the written version of the answer. Um, you know, Our Christian Street of Worship Got Any Day of the Week. This is the question that I post on ebible.com. And I go on to say in part of my answer there, which is part of my commentary here. How one answers this question about are Christians free to worship God any day of the week? Uh, are we free to worship God any day of the week is how the original question was posed. That's why it says we. If the we are Gentile Christians, so suppose we, a person says, are we free to worship God in his ache? If the we is a Christian, I can only say that the early Messianic communities in Paul's day were a sect of Judaism. Go back and read Acts 24, 14. So the we of Paul's day, the Gentile Christians, were actually a branch of Judaism. They were a sect known as the way, and this means that they were actually um, keeping Sabbath days right alongside their Jewish counterparts in the synagogues. So the we were actually keep the we Christians of Paul's day were actually keeping Sabbath. This means the Gentile members must have been quite familiar with and most certainly respectful of Torah, even if they did not fully embrace it as Gentile believers. And you can go back and read Acts 15, 19 through 21 to make sure you catch that. In Paul's day, there was a high respect for the Torah among Gentile members very early on because that, that, that was, again, it was the natural continuation of the communities of faith that Paul had established uh, in the synagogues 
and the the offshoot of them were the sects that were breaking away. It wasn't till a little a lot later on that we began to see uh, maybe even a couple hundred years. It was earlier in the first century, I know. We had Marcion in the early first century. But it wouldn't be for several hundred years later until we finally had um, um, edicts that were actually written and put together to make formal breaks from the synagogue, a formal break from Judaism, a formal break from uh, Sabbath and t- uh, t- uh, Torah keeping and things like that. So that's what was going on. I go on to say, indeed, the evidence from extant First century rabbinic writings, i.e. the Mishnah, indicates that Gentiles without legal Jewish status were forbidden from embracing the Torah. So, um, uh, uh, very early on, Jewish sentiment was pushing back against Gentiles wanting to embrace certain parts of Torah, uh, particularly Sabbath later on. But the Gentiles who were brought into uh, fellowship with God through Messiah and through Paul's own writings were certainly exposed to a healthy dose of Torah teaching from Paul himself, who was a master Torah teacher and a lifelong Torah keeper. And therefore, um, from, from that perspective, it wouldn't have been unnatural for Gentiles to keep Sabbath and Torah in Paul's own communities, even if later on it was something that the church um, decided to abandon in their uh, discussions. And this, of course, made the Jews happy that the Gentile Christians were abandoning Torah, keeping Sabbath, keeping things like that. And it made the church happy to uh, formulate their own separate communities and things like that. I go on to uh, conclude. Thus, popular opinion today would say no to this question as to whether or not um, the question being, um, are are we free to uh, choose any day of the week, citing the Christian freedom themes taught in the New Testament. Okay, So just keep in mind there was a question that I'm answering here. I go on to conclude, and let me just read this last paragraph, and we'll conclude tonight's study on Romans 14. However, if the we as Jewish people, right, are we free to worship God any day of the week, and the certain day implies Sabbath, then the answer is an emphatic yes, for indeed, Jews are covenantly bound by God and Torah to worship on seventh-day Sabbath, and we've got a bevy of verses that we looked at in the uh, video. The point is taken very easily from the Torah, that God enjoins Torah keeping, which includes Sabbath keeping, on Israel, which includes Jewish people. So very few people today would argue that the Jews are covenantly bound against this, would, would, would uh, argue against the Jews being covenantly bound to keep the Torah and Sabbath. Most Christians would agree that the Torah is for Jews and the Sabbath is for Jews. Most Jews, of course, would also agree with the same. Nearly everybody agrees that the Torah is for Jews and that the Jews are not only able to keep it, but should be keeping it. It's their covenant duty. So Paul was Jewish, and he kept Torah his lifelong uh, he kept Torah as his lifelong uh, habit and duty, and this would include Sabbath keeping. And I go on to say this most naturally includes we Messianic Jews, right? Since, uh, like Paul himself, we are still 100% Jewish, read Acts 22.3, and we are 100% Messianic, read Acts 24.14, right? So we're 100% Jews, we're 100% uh, believers in Jesus. Neither one of those discounts us from keeping Torah or Sabbath. And we are 100% part of Israel, right? Romans 11.1. 11, so on all counts, we can and should be keeping Torah and Sabbath. We're Jewish, we're Messianic, we're part of Israel. I go on to say, what is more, even the popular opinion teaches that the Torah is for Jews. Even if I don't believe that it's exclusively for Jews, it is true that it is for Jews. But the secret is, is it for Gentiles too? The answer, of course, is yes, it is for Gentiles if you're in covenant with God. So, That will be our study for Romans 14 tonight, and we'll begin to look at some of the conclusions next week on this question of whether or not Paul is talking about a Sabbath versus Sunday debate in Romans 14 verses 5 and 6. We'll look through some of the conclusions, and then we'll be returned to uh, start looking at the next few verses in my study here. Who is the brother in uh, Romans 14, 10 through 13? Are the brothers exclusive to Christians? Do the brothers include Messianic Jews? Are they Gentile Christians only? Do they include Messianic Jews? Or do they perhaps even include unbelieving Jews who are part of the uh, uh, synagogue communities? (music) 